Um, hi all and welcome to New York City DSA Night School. Tonight is part of our series on socialism in America. We're going to discuss McCarthyism. This topic is a departure from most of the other ses sessions in the series where the focus is shifted from the good work of our predecessors to forces that stand against us. With the rising far right to see socialists striving for a more just society as a threat to their way of life and a liberal center that seemingly would take fascism over socialism, the lessons we can learn from the McCarthy era are substantial. Tonight we'll hear from DSA members, Doug Henwood and Chip Gibbons on this history, followed by Q&A. Uh, but first a word about why we do political education. Of course, the forces we are up against are formidable. They have the power and the money. We, on the other hand, have the numbers and just cause. And while activism is essential, activism without strategies informed by sharp analysis can't achieve the big structural reforms we seek. By studying social movements, reading history and theory, we can learn from our predecessors and fellow activists both what works and what's less effective. We strengthen our critical thinking skills, better understand what we're up against in the struggle, and so are better prepared in the fight. And with that, we thank you for being here. As much as we learn from text, we also learn from each other. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Alice for a moment to give us community agreements, and then I'll introduce our guests. Hi, all. <clears throat> thank you for joining us. Um, so our community agreements, we're all here to learn. So assume best intentions and be comradely. Uh, and then just to keep the flow of conversation, we ask that you keep your remarks, um, questions, comments to around 30 seconds, just to keep things flowing. Um, and then how we <clears throat> sort out who's speaking, um, you put yourself on stack, which will be easy that we're on Zoom, you just put in the chat stack uh, and then you'll be added um, to the list of people waiting to speak. Um, I think that is it. If anyone wants to add any to our community agreements. Oh. Um, thanks, thanks, Alice. Um, uh, so now it, it is my great pleasure to welcome Doug Henwood and Chip Gibbons. Doug Henwood is an economic journalist and host of Celebrated Left Podcast Behind the News, which covers the worlds of economics and politics and their complex interactions from the local to the global. His area of focus is the ruling class, uh, a book about which is purportedly in the work. He also is a cherished long-term member of New York City DSA Political Education. Chip Gibbons is joining us from Washington, D.C., uh, where he is policy director of Defending Rights and Dissent, uh, where he has advised members of Congress on reigning in the FBI and reforming the Espionage Act. In 2020, he published an expose at The Intercept based on his half decade long quest to force the FBI to release documents pertaining to its surveillance of nonviolent Palestinian solidarity activists. Chip has also covered the legal proceedings against Julian Assange and Daniel Hale for Jacobin. Chip is currently working on a book on the history of the FBI, exploring the relationship between domestic political surveillance and the emergence of the US national security state. Uh, titled The Imperial Bureau, it will be published by Verso. Someday. Um, Someday. Someday. <laughs> oh, maybe you and Doug can I have a the bio, and every year I move the date back by one year. So uh just someday. Okay, no well, one from Bruce is watching, I hope. Uh, someday, maybe. I don't know. Okay. You 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 yours and um your book and Doug's book on the ruling elite someday will appear and we'll all look forward to um seeing it then. Uh but uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Doug. Um, thank you, Carrington. Thank you all for coming, and uh, apologies for the last-minute rearrangement of everything. Um, life is full of uncertainty. Um, Chip, um, my book for Verso was six years late, so, um, you know, there, there are precedents for this sort of thing. <laughs> um, my setup here isn't ideal, um, so I apologize if there are any infelicities uh, um, uh, of, of, uh, of flow or of uh, logistics. Um, strictly speaking, uh, the term McCarthyism is misleading. Now, I'm oh, sorry, I should say I'm going to talk for a bit, uh, the prehistory of McCarthyism, and then turn things over to Chip. He can talk about Hoover, and I'll come back to uh, give the full McCarthy and after story. 
Um, strictly speaking, the term McCarthyism is misleading, as we learned a few weeks ago uh, here. Uh, it wasn't the first Red Scare. The first Red Scare, which ran from 1918 to 20, may have been shorter than the second, but it was plenty intense. The second Red Scare is usually dated as running from 1946, as we were adjusting to a world where the Soviet Union was no longer our wartime ally, to 1956, when, among other things, the liberal turn in the feder uh, federal judiciary made the Holy War hard to prosecute. The heyday of McCarthyism uh, itself, or McCarthy himself rather, ran for less than half of that decade from 1950 to 54. But the Red Scare too was much larger than McCarthy himself. And paradoxically, his fall gave the scare, uh, scare a few more years of life by replacing his frenzy with, a few, uh, with more measured forms of persecution. Although the frenzy itself did have a lot of work by scaring the hell out of everyone. The House of Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, was founded as a temporary panel in 1938 uh, and led by a te Texas Democrat, Martin Deese. And uh, Karen, do we have slides? Yeah. Martin Deese's slide three for a, a picture of the man. Hold on one second. We have the slides for going. I used to have a framed picture of HUAC as my background before my cat <laughs> removed it and I got the bookshelf. Um, I could have been the slide. Everybody's okay. a critic. Can you can people see the uh, screen, the slides? Yeah, I can see it, but I'm I'm hiding it so I can read my text here. Um, so we're on, slide three is uh, Martin Deese, uh, HUAC founder, uh, with some files on CIO, CIO officials. Um, uh, HUAC was initially founded as a temporary committee, um, but uh, in 1946 it was made permanent. Uh, first, it was suggested the Klan might be an appropriate target of investigation, but that idea was rejected, which led Mississippi Democrat John Rankin to comment, after all, the KKK is an old American institution, which is true enough. HUAC cut its teeth on the investigation of Alger Hiss, uh, slide four. Um, that began in 1948. Uh, Hiss, who had uh, served in a variety of government posts in the 30s and 40s, was denounced as a communist and spy by a former communist who turned to the right, Whitaker Chambers. Uh, he's there on the right, uh, his is on the left in the slide. Although the statute of limitations for espionage had expired, his got indicted for lying to Congress in previous testimony and convicted. He served almost four years. Chambers, though he admitted having lied in earlier testimony under oath, was never indicted. This isn't the place to go into the whole his chambers affair. One can go mad pursuing it like JFK or assassination arcana. But some arguments, uh, uh, some argue that the documents released after the collapse of the USSR convert, confirmed that Hiss was an agent uh, of the Soviet Union. Several Soviet historians and former officials have rejected such claims. But whatever the truth, the Hiss affair really helped get, uh, the Red Scare get going. It also helped launch the career of HUAC member Richard Nixon who would plague the, country, plague the country for decades to come. From the first, intra-class tensions were prominent. Uh, for example, the contrast in appearance between Hiss and Chambers uh, makes that point visually. The more fervent Red Hunters were generally from non-metropolitan areas in the South and Midwest. They were mostly of modest origins and didn't go to fancy colleges. Their tar targets were often aristocratic products of high-end prep schools and the Ivy League. Although they were mostly anti-communist themselves, some flirted with radical politics in the 1930s, but to their antagonist, their cosmopolitan matter reeked of communist sympathies and maybe gay ones as well. In 1940, Congress passed the Smith Act, which made it a crime to knowingly or willingly, uh, willfully rather, advocate, abet, or advise, or teach the duty, necessity, desirability, or propriety of overthrowing or destroying any government in the United States by force or violence. The next year, Attorney General Francis Biddle indicted members of the Socialist Workers' Party because its manifesto endorsed overthrowing capitalism by force if necessary. The main reason for the prosecution was not fear of Trotskyists so much as pressure from the Teamsters Union president because an SWP-run dissident faction was giving him a hard time. 18 SWPers were convicted and did time. The Communist Party supported the prosecution because they hated Trotskyists so much. Before our Trotskyist friends get up in arms about this, Trotsky himself was going to testify before HUAC, but couldn't get a visa. He was planning to submit written testimony, but then he was killed. The feds uh, showed the uh, CP no gratitude for its earlier support of the Smith Act. 
1948, they indicted 11 of its top leaders for violating the act, not for anything that it had done, but for something Lenin wrote in State and Revolution. The replacement of the bourgeois by the proletariat state is impossible without violent revolution. Though the government's investigation began with suspicions of espionage, it turned instead to this sedition through reading list strategy. It was a way of criminalizing membership in the party without explicitly doing so. All 11 uh, defendants were convicted and did from three to five years. The judge also sentenced their lawyers to jail time for contempt. Over the next several years, lower level officials of the CP are also prosecuted, among them Claudia Jones, a black feminist forced within the party, and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a founding member of the ACLU, about her more in a bit. It was extremely difficult for them to find lawyers given the contempt charges against the first set of Smith Act attorneys and the government's threat to declare the National Lawyers Guild, a left-wing uh, lawyers group, a subversive organization. And now I'll hand things over to Chip, who will talk about J. Edgar Hoover, slide five. There is J. Edgar in two phases of his life, and then a taste of his files we can see on slide six. I'll be back uh, to talk about McCarthy himself after Chip tells us all about the evil Hoover. Yeah, so I want to thank Doug. He really set the stage. Am I unmuted here? I want to make sure I'm, yes. So I really want to thank Doug. He really set the stage well here because I think it is important to remember that while McCarthyism is named after Joseph McCarthy, it does evoke a wider set of anti-communist practices during the Cold War, such as the Hollywood blacklist, et cetera. And I would also want to start with a quote from the leading historian of McCarthyism, Ellen Schrecker, who said, had observed known in the 1950s what they learned in the 1970s when the Freedom Information Act opened the Bureau's files, McCarthyism would probably have been called Hooverism, for the FBI was the bureaucratic heart of the McCarthy era. Uh, one such example of this sort of new scholarship that came out in the late 70s, early, um, early 80s is Kenneth O'Reilly's book, uh, Hoover and the Un-Americans, and it's a really groundbreaking study. It's unfortunate that it's out of print now, but it, 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 it's a groundbreaking study of the Second Red Scare, and he looks at the, declass the recently declassified documents. And what he argues, and what has persuaded me as a historian of the FBI, and what I think Schrecker is probably alluding to here, is that um, you know, the Cold War would have happened with or without the FBI. I, I don't think you can blame the FBI for that. But the FBI shaped the contours of the Cold War at home. So intelligence and military bureaucrats, Pure O'Reilly, uh, in general, understand that Cold War priorities meant that the public opinion and official Washington had to be moved right. It'd be the FBI who'd play the role here. So what O'Reilly uncovered in these documents was that the FBI leadership did not believe a Cold War at home would automatically produce McCarthyism a Cold War abroad would automatically produce McCarthyism at home, but obviously we needed McCarthyism at home in order to make the Cold War machinery run well. It also was like all of these sorts of red scares and repressions, a, a great way for people in the ruling class to settle long scores against the left. So uh, the FBI sets about a deliberate program to bring it about. Um, and I'm, I'm going to backtrack for a minute here because the McCarthyism of the early Cold War period certainly stemmed from the geopolitical aspects of the Cold War. But as Doug mentioned, you know, anti-communism, anti-radicalism, counter-subversion has deeper roots in the U.S. politics. We generally think about uh, the period in 1918 to 1920 as the first Red Scare. We usually think about the later uh, the McCarthy as the second Red Scare. There's also a little red scare in the 30s. There's all kinds of things in the 1870s and, and stuff that people label the real first red scare. So, so going all the way back to the Haymarket affair, the formation of red squads, the political persecution during World War I, there's a really long history of the ruling class believing that it is necessary to use political persecution through law enforcement and intelligence to stifle radical thought. And as Frank Donner, one of the greatest historians of US government surveillance said, you know, J. Edgar Hoover is a man of his times. And that means he was a counter subversive uh, obsessive or counter subversive fanatic. So we generally think of the FBI as a law enforcement, well, 
most people do. I don't know about this one. People think the FBI is a law enforcement agency, but it's actually both an intelligence and a law enforcement agency. And for most of its history, the law enforcement function has been secondary. Since 9-11, the official goal of the FBI or official description of the FBI has been that it's an intelligence-driven national security agency with intelligence and law enforcement components. Law enforcement is last in that list. I would also note they mentioned intelligence twice, which is probably an indication of how much intelligence they actually have there. Um, the FBI is started in 1908 against the will of Congress, and then Hoover enters the picture as the head of the first FBI intelligent unit. Uh, this unit is originally called the Radical Division. They later changed to the General Intelligence Division. Um, and as part of this division, you know, Hoover had worked at the Library of Congress, and he creates an index of radicals similar to the card catalog. The index included 450,000 names. For 70,000 people on this index, they created bios of them, and they also would index radical propaganda. And the, the big thing this uh, radical division was engaged in were the Palmer raids, where they arrested 10,000 people. Only a couple hundred of them were actually deported. The Palmer raids were based on immigration law because the FBI actually had no statutes to enforce against these people. And Hoover really liked immigration law because he believed that it didn't include constitutional protections. This backfires against him terribly. It's actually very paradoxical because it sort of accelerates him as a celebrity anti-radical, but there's huge, huge backlash to the Palmer raids. Uh, the Secretary of Labor has it shut down. Hoover investigates him for being a secret wobbly, um, you know, real, real Hoover-like moments. Um, and up until at least the late 50s, the FBI is extremely sensitive about the claim that Hoover was behind the Palmer raids, which he was, uh, but they tried to blame it on other people. Uh, and a lot of the stuff you see during this time period very much pre-configures the McCarthy period, right? You have these list of radicals, you have claims that civil rights protests are caused by the Soviet Union, the Wobblies, you have claims that Americans have it too good, so they would never go on strike. So the wave of labor agitation is caused by the Wobblies, the Soviets, who knows what else. And this sort of idea that people were being riled up by radicals that had no legitimate grievances, or they were turning to radicalism because it spoke to the existence of, of their life. Uh, in 1924, there's a new attorney general who is a friend of ACLU founder Roger Baldwin. He asks Hoover what laws is any of this based off of. Hoover admits there are none. They shut the general intelligence division down, but they make Hoover head of the FBI. Um, what happens for the next 10 or 15 years is a big point of dispute. But I, I think you can say that the FBI at least abandoned a formal program of domestic political policing. Hoover is an arch reactionary, but he is beloved by our greatest liberal president, Roosevelt. And in the 30s, Hoover gets Roosevelt to put in a number of directives, one of which is entirely secret. Per, per Hoover, Roosevelt didn't want to put it in writing because it would leak to the press, but Roosevelt promised him it was in a vault in Hyde Park. No one has ever found this document, uh, but we have Hoover's, you know, memorandum of what he says happened, and, and he claims that... Uh, Roosevelt is upset because the Secret Service has infiltrators in every communist group, but they're only merely concerned with plots on the president's life. What he needs is general intelligence information on communist and fascist, and Roosevelt didn't know how he could ever get this information. Lo and behold, Hoover had just been called upon, and he devised this scheme where under a, a State Department funding provision from 1916, I think maybe even earlier than that, they could gather this information. It's also clear, as the church committee has noted, that Hoover, per his own memo, is providing him with providing Roosevelt with intelligence on Harry Bridges with the National Newspaper Guild, which would indicate they were already gathering things. Uh, at this point, it's clear we're going to be probably in a world war, and there's a fight over who will get to do domestic intelligence. The FBI wants it. The State Department wants it. 
military intelligence wants it, vigilantes want it, and Hoover gets really sick of carrying out investigations of the communists and Nazis under this State Department funding provision because he claims the State Department is trying to chisel away the power of the FBI, and there's, there's no greater sin than chiseling away at the FBI. And I, I'm not going to go through the full bureaucratic history here, but Hoover basically comes to this sort of agreement where he gets control over uh, domestic security. And part of how he does this is he cites all of the vigilante violence and Palmer raids and attacks on civil liberties during the First World War, which he incited and says, oh, no, we need professionals who can do this. So they'll respect civil liberties. Not not a good choice. But in, in 1939, Roosevelt issues this very controversial uh, directive. People have debated for decades what it did or didn't authorize. But up until 1971, the FBI uses this directive to basically spy on political speech. Um, and in addition to this, they start making this uh, list of people to be detained in the event of an emergency. And this is another factor of FBI political uh, surveillance is that the FBI sort of got around the, there's no crime going on here, uh, provision problem by saying, we're making list of people who will be dangerous in a national emergency so the government can come around them up should said emergency happen. Uh, Attorney General Biddle makes him shred the list. He renames it, which up until the late 1970s, the FBI was still claiming that by just renaming the list, Hoover had complied with his with with the Biddle order. Uh, but subsequent cold, uh, subsequent attorney generals will will validate the list. Um, so at this point in 1939, Hoover has a program of investigating subversives through domestic security investigations, partially premised on an executive order, partially premised on the need to detain people in an emergency. Uh, the original targets are the Nazis and communists, but they very quickly extend to the Socialist Workers Party and the Puerto Rican uh, independence movement. Pretty much in all of these uh, repressions, it starts Communist Party, then expands to Socialist Workers Party and Puerto Rican independence movement, and then expands to there to any political movement arguing they've been touched by them. So at the end of World War II, the FBI still has all these powers, and lo and behold, they don't disband them. Uh, they instruct field agents to end its intelligence investigations of nationalistic supporters of Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, or Imperial Japan, but field officers were explicitly instructed to keep their investigations into communist, the Socialist Workers Party, and the Nationalist Party of Puerto Rico. Uh, and then in 1946, they resume a practice they had discontinued earlier of investigating every single member of the Communist Party uh, as a security investigation. And, and once again, I want to stress security investigations have no law enforcement purpose. They're not investigating people for breaking laws. They're just giving this general picture of the radical situation in, in the event of an emergency. And in 1946, a year before Truman gives the Truman Doctrine speech, the FBI is gearing up to educate the public about the Communist Party. They believe in the event of a, a conflict with the Soviet Union, the Communist Party will be disloyal and act as a fifth column. And they also believe the Communist Party has like superhuman powers. Uh, there's one FBI document, I, I think I probably should just start reading from it, we'll be here too long, about the Spanish Civil War, where they explain that 65% of Americans supported the Republicans because that's what the communists wanted them to believe. And therefore the majority of Americans were uh, actively aiding the Soviet Union, which, I mean, if you're in the FBI and 65% of the American population are Soviet agents, that's pretty, pretty uh, scary. It's also insane um, or unreasonable. And, you know, the FBI claims in multiple documents that the 30s were a pink or red decade and that it had become fashionable for deluded people to espouse communist causes, including artists, clergy, and lawyers and entertainers, that um, the without the FBI, communists were able to convince people they were a legitimate political party, 
individual communists had even successfully pictured themselves as the heirs to the traditions of our founding father. And that for this reason, the communist party had this layer of liberals and trade unions who supported them and they were able to influence public opinion. I think somewhere Hoover said for every one communist, there's 10 dupes who do their work for them. So in the event of a national emergency, they'd have to put the communist away, but they'd be besieged with letters and angry complaints from liberals. And as you know, that is something the FBI takes so seriously. So they have to set about a program of national education so that, and this is the quote, in the event of an emergency, we will have an informed public. So the FBI goes about informing the public that the Communist Party is not just like other parties. Uh, education consists of propaganda like Masters of Deceit, public testimony, feeding information to HUAC, and manipulation of groups like the American Legion. Uh, also, Hoover becomes convinced that a successful prosecution of the Communist Party would educate the public that they were not just any party. So the FBI begins this quote unquote secret brief developing this legal theory about how you can prosecute the communists under the Smith Act. And when the uh, Justice Department asks for some sort of guidance, they get this long brief they never knew existed. I would note that while the Socialist Workers Party uh, prosecution was supported by the communist, the Socialist Workers Party did not uh, support the prosecution of the communist. But Hoover considered this really an important victory on for him against the forces of communism, because you have a jury finding the communist party is an illegal conspiracy, and you have the Supreme Court upholding what he says. Uh, eventually, as Doug notes, in 1956, the Supreme Court becomes more liberal, uh, and this leads the FBI to believe there are no prosecutorial efforts against the Communist Party, and they begin their first uh, counterintelligence or cointel program. There's actually 11 separate cointel pros. It's, it's not one program uh, against the Communist Party in order to heighten factional differences within the party. Uh, one of the things they instruct their informants to do is not to labor on a dispute where you've clearly lost because people will think you're a sectarian. Probably the only lesson I wish people on the left would take from the FBI, but um, if you've ever been to left form, they don't follow that advice there. Um, and then a couple of things I really want to leave you with before I give back time to Doug, who's been generous in letting me present. All of the attacks on the CP quickly extend to the Socialist Workers Party and Puerto Rican Nationalist. Hoover and Co. saw the party's support as being not just members, but the influence in society. I have the, for one member, 10 dupes quote. Uh, Hoover also claimed that while it was not possible to know if someone was a Communist Party member, they could be identified for following the Communist Party line. And this is what he said about this. The burden of proof should be placed on those who consistently follow the ever-changing, twisty, par twisting party line. Fellow travelers and sympathizers can deny party membership, but can never escape the undeniable fact that they have played into the communist hands, thus furthering the communist cause by playing the role of innocent, gullible, gullible or willful allies. And the FBI would do quarterly reports of what the communist line was on different issues. And when they would go through things like the Nation Magazine or National Lawyers Guild reports, they do like paragraphs side by side. And um, there's a really uh, funny one from the Nation Mag, a 1958 Nation Magazine issue on um, the FBI, of course, where they mention in the Nation that Congress had found Hoover was responsible for the Palmer raids. And they put that next to the Daily Worker, which says Hoover was responsible for the, for the Palmer raids. Go, ha, they're doing the communist line. The fact that the source is Congress doesn't seem to matter. Um, and then the big thing is that they operated on what's called subversive infiltration theory, which allowed them to spy on and destroy not only groups that were subversive, but those that were being infiltrated or might be infiltrated by subversives. Uh, in some cases, as noted by the United States Senate, they were more hostile to the groups that were supposedly being unduly influenced than the the influencers. So this is actually where most of the FBI's abuses 
against Martin Luther King come from. Uh, later in the 60s, they develop a racial intelligence unit. They develop a Black extremism cointel pro. But the investigation on King is initially opened as a common filler, communist infiltration investigation. The wiretap that another great liberal who liked Hoover, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. signs, is explicitly to find out if uh, Martin Luther King is talking on the phone to communists, which isn't a crime, right? You can talk on the phone to whoever you want in this country, supposedly. But but this sort of never-ending sphere of going after first the communists because they're foreign back, then the Socialist Workers Party because they're also Marxist, then the Puerto Ricans, and then any group that might be influenced by them. And it's very interesting because the groups that need to be spied on for being potentially overtaken by subversives are always groups the FBI already hates, police, anti-police brutality, anti-war. These are also the groups they do the preventative terrorism investigations into now. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. And then I would say that like a lot of the internal security policies of the McCarthy era, the FBI's domestic intelligence operations really lasted until the 70s, which is also how long QAC uh, lasted and the subversive and the attorney general's uh, subversive activities list lasted. And following these checks on them, which come from Watergate, from Vietnam, from the Church Committee, uh, the new right begins this process of saying, because we've gotten rid of the House and American Activities Committee, because we've gotten rid of the Subversive Activities Control Board, because we've gotten rid of the um, Attorney General Subversive Activity List, because we have forced the FBI to domestically only investigate crimes, we're now under siege for terrorism. Uh, the Heritage Foundation puts out a 1978 paper where they say, if, if we don't bring back these uh, QAC and the FBI, we're going to end up like Rhodesia, which is an apartheid state. Very interesting choice for the Heritage Foundation and be besieged by terrorists. So I think a lot of, this is my final word, I think a lot of people realize that sort of after 9-11, you know, terrorism became the justification for spy on everyone in the way communism was. But in the 70s and 80s, there is a very conscious effort by veterans of the McCarthy period to rebrand anti-communism as counterterrorism. And if I had more time, I'd explain why. This is very evident as to why the counterterrorism bureaucracy functions much the same way the anti-communist anti bureaucracy functions. Going after the same groups, right? I, I have a, a, a paper I got from my lawsuit against the FBI for my book the other month. One month before 9-11, big terrorist threat are anarchists and communists because they shot McKinley and they've been protesting the World Bank. So they're going to do more terrorism. Not a really prescient uh, observation in August 2001 in terms of coming terrorist threats. And I think I have probably exceeded my time, so I will hand it back over to Doug. Thank you, Chip. That was terrific uh, and very uh, informative. And, you know, um, I guess we're going to hear more about COINTELPRO when we get to in, in night school, gets to the 60s uh, and 70s, because they really uh, went pretty crazy in those days. Um, and I noticed over your left shoulder some, um, some of the objectively seditious literature. Uh, Lenin and Marx, um, right, which could yeah. have gotten you prosecuted at some point in the past. All right, Joe McCarthy. Uh, he was born in Grand Chute, Wisconsin, 1908. Personable and ambitious. He, uh, okay, no, I just lost my screen here. Let's see if I get that back. Here we go. Um, personable and ambitious. Uh, he uh, eyed politics. At the age of 31, he ran against a local judge who'd been in office for 24 years. He beat him in a campaign that would set the tone for his career, lying about his opponent's age, his mental status, and his salary. But McCarthy also had political skills, talking to everyone and even remembering their dog's names. He showed little interest in world events, despite his interest in politics or culture either. A friend said Joe looked at only one book in his life, that was Mein Kampf. When uh, World War II broke out, McCarthy joined the Marines. Although his judgeship would have given him an exemption, he figured military service would be good for his political career. At first, he worked in intelligence, but he wanted to become a tail gunner, later the source of his mocking nickname, Tail Gunner Joe. And we can see a picture of him in slide seven as in that getup. 
uh, ah, lost my screen again. Uh, he exploits as a tail gunner were most, mostly faked. He wanted to break the record for the most rounds ever fired in a single mission. So he took off and fired out of the back of the plane at coconut trees. He got this frolic written up in the Wisconsin papers and he forged an injury report uh, just to um, add to the, uh, the drama. In 1944, while still in the Pacific, he decided to run for the Senate. He lost, but he not very badly. And when he came back, he ran again. In 1946, he won, beating Robert La Follette Jr., heir to the, Washington, uh, the Wisconsin political dynasty. His campaign again relied heavily on lies about his opponent, and he won uh, the 61-37 landslide. And La Follette uh, committed suicide soon afterwards. So uh, McCarthy left a lot of corpses in his wake. At that point, Republicans are amping up their anti-communism, equating the New Deal with the red threat. Along with McCarthy, a whole crop of right-wing Republicans won an election in 1946, Richard Nixon among them, mostly from the Midwest and West. In his biographer David Ashinsky's words, they were determined to rid the government of communist perverts and New Dealers, get tough with Joe Stalin, and crack down on labor unions. McCarthy uh, liked this very much, uh, but uh, uh, after an, an initial splash, he fizzled out. Uh, his uh, dream of success were eluding him. Uh, halfway through his term, political abits were already being written. So he amped up the anti-communism. He finally hit the jackpot with a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, February 1950. In it, he claimed to have in his hand a list of 205 that were known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party. Uh, um, who uh, nevertheless are still working and shaping policy in the State Department. That's slide eight now. When some Wisconsin reporters asked him for evidence, he replied, I've got a sock full of shit and I know how to use it. Days later, he revised the count, uh, the count of subversives down to 57. A few more days later, it was back up to 81. He never showed the list to anyone because it didn't exist. He would go on in this vein for almost four more years. The Wheeling speech energized the right and much of the Republican Party approved. He got lots of fan mail, as we can see uh, in the uh, slide nine there. He could do the dirty work and shield the mainstream of the party from the splattering mud. The Senate, controlled by Democrats, appointed a subcommittee, chaired by a conservative Maryland Democrat, Millard Tidings, to investigate McCarthy's claims. McCarthy took advantage of the opportunity to launch an extended campaign against Asia scholar Owen Lattimore, which could, would continue long after the Tiding Subcommittee's, uh, Subcommittee's final report. The final report dismissed McCarthy's charges as bogus, but Republicans wouldn't sign on to it, so it was perceived as a partisan, partisan document and had little effect. North Korea's invasion of the South in June 1950, also the year of Alger Hiss's perjury conviction, helped spin things in McCarthy's directions. The Dems lost some seats in that year's congressional elections, though not as many as they could have. But the Republicans viewed McCarthy as a hero, and pundits developed an awe, developed an awe for his strength. He got his revenge on tidings by campaigning against him, a campaign that featured this fake photo, slide 10, uh, done by a newspaper friend of his. Put together from two separate photos, it supposedly depicted tidings in conversation with Communist Party head or Earl Browder. Of course, it was completely fake. Tidings lost, though. McCarthy took advantage of his strength coming out of that election and, intensi and, uh, and intensified his war against the State Department, headed by someone he despised, the patrician Dean Acheson, slide 11. He held more hearings, harassed more witnesses, and ruined more lives. Uh, slide 12 has a picture of Acheson um, in a chance meeting in an elevator. They barely uh, met otherwise, but somehow they ran into each other in a Senate elevator, uh, and uh, McCarthy looks to be enjoying the experience a lot more than Acheson did. The right-wing press cheered all this on. The establishment press was critical, but uh, McCarthy just missed them as taking dictation from Moscow. Time magazine publisher Henry Luce suggested McCarthy was doing damage to the anti-communist cause, but then he sent letters to uh, Luce's principal advertisers, so Luce, uh, Luce uh, kept quiet. Along with the right-wing press, McCarthy had the support of what in Marxist shorthand we would call the provincial petty bourgeoisie, like Texas oil men, uh, Clint Murchison and H.L. Hunt. Mainstream corporate America, while plenty anti-communist, was uncomfortable with the style that McCarthy was pursuing his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, communist hot pin. 
His popular support came from business people, small business people in the heartland, as well as some urban Catholics, including Joseph Kennedy. There were a few intellectuals like William F. Buckley. I had a bit from his uh, book in defense of McCarthy on a supplementary reading list. Uh, he had a few people like that in his corner, but not many. When Eisenhower became president in 1953, both houses of Congress also fell into Republican hands. The GOP thought McCarthy's fervor would cool, but it didn't. Eisenhower, who despised McCarthy, was afraid to go after him. He tightened up the loyalty checks thinking that would derail Joe, but they didn't. Seeking to appease him, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles appointed a Cretanous McCarthy crony who thought the Foreign Service had been infiltrated by ferries and gave him a staff of 350 to investigate the department. Hundreds of State Department people left, lost their jobs. Dulles grew alarmed that the State Department's rep very reputation was at stake because of all the investigations. At the same time, Hoover, who preferred the systematic approach of a seasoned bureaucrat, began having increased res uh, increasing reservations about McCarthy, bringing disrepute on the anti-communist trade. But Dulles never challenged McCarthy, nor did Hoover stop feeding him information. The CIA, though, was a tougher nut. McCarthy was convinced it was full of commies, which it wasn't. And in fact, you know, during this whole period, the Communist Party had been reduced to a shell of its former self. It was a pretty big deal in the 1930s, but by the 1950s, it was pretty much nothing, but it was very useful um, uh, for, for um, red scare mongers. Uh, the CIA, however, was indisputably full of the skull and bones types, the Yale Secret Society that McCarthy loathed. And in 1953, he zeroed in on bonesman William Bundy, the less famous brother of McGeorge. LBJ called William the other McBundy, the other Bundy. McGeorge himself acted as an enforcer at Harvard, demanding ex-communists name names if they wanted the job, if they wanted the job there. CIA head Alan Dulles, brother of John Foster, just ignored McCarthy's subpoenas. McCarthy was very frustrated, but he really didn't, couldn't do much about it. Columnist Joe Alsop, who was practically on the CIA payroll, announced that the Wisconsin senator had suffered his first defeat. There are many more to come. McCarthy's undoing was his investigation of the US Army. It started with his interest in the alleged sell of Reds and spies at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. He focused on the case of one Irving Perez, a Queens dentist who may have been a communist, didn't fill out all his loyalty forms correctly, but nonetheless got an honorable discharge. An outrage, McCarthy dragged in Perez's superior, General Ralph Zwicker, and insulted him in terms that scandalized many. He then went after the Secretary of the Army. That was the final straw for Eisenhower, who resolved to do in McCarthy. About this time, March 1954, the esteemed TV broadcaster Edward R. Murrow put together a report of mainly embarrassing clips of McCarthy, not just fulminating, but picking his nose and belching publicly too. Days after the broadcast of the report, the army told McCarthy they were about to put together uh, a report on uh, his top aide, the evil Roy Cohn, had pull strings on behalf of his friend G. David Schein, who had been drafted into the army and was looking for an easy time of it. That slide 13 shows the two of them together. Uh, the army told McCarthy that if he fired Cohn, they'd spike the report, but McCarthy said no, so they released it. It showed Cohn pulling those strings. McCarthy's response was to accuse the army of trying to evade investigations of the commies and queers at Fort, Mon of Fort Monmouth. He commenced hearings on the sub subject in April 1954, saying the army's charges have been given greater aid and comfort to the communist and security risks than any single obstacle ever designed. Uh, hyperbole was his normal mode of speech. This investigation was his undoing. Going after diplomats is one thing, but going after the military is career suicide. Cohn's own testimony in the matter was disastrous. The legendary climax of the hearings came when McCarthy badgered an associate of the Army's counsel, Joseph Welch, a counsel named Fred Fisher. Fisher had a history with the leftist National Lawyers Guild, and rather than risk scandal, Welch told Fisher to stay home and not work with him on the hearings. That wasn't enough for McCarthy, who denounced Fisher. Welch interrupted, uttering the most famous lines of the Army McCarthy hearings. You have done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? The dam broke. McCarthy's reputation collapsed even among his former allies, as did his Gallup approval ratings, as we see on slide 14. Initially, they were kind of low. They improved dramatically uh, as uh, McCarthy soared to fame. But at the end of 1954, um, with the McCarthy, uh, the uh, Army McCarthy hearings, they collapsed. 
At the end of 1954, the Senate censured him. It was the last time he made the front pages until his death two and a half years later. Long a heavy boozer, the collapse of his reputation threw the drinking to overdrive and his liver gave out in May 1957. Slide 15 shows uh, the residents of his hometown waiting for his uh, corpse to arrive. One of the most egregious instances of torture through McCarthyism was that of Owen Lattimore, slide 16. In March 1950, a month after the Wheeling speech, McCarthy accused Lattimore, an Asian scholar of liberal views, of being a communist agent. To the right, Lattimore was part of a group of liberal China hands who were responsible for the loss of China to Mao's revolution. Lattimore is associated with the Institute of Specific Relations, a think tank formed in 1925, which came under attack from one of its members, Alfred Kohlberg, a reactionary businessman with extensive interest in China. Uh, he accused um, uh, the Institute and Lattimore in particular of being in the sway of the Reds. To be fair, there were a few communists around the Institute, uh, not Lattimore, but they had nothing to do with Mao's Trump. Kohlberg had a particular animus for Lattimore, which is probably where McCarthy learned of him. One of McCarthy's star witnesses, Louis Boudens, more on him in a moment, had said in 1947 and again in 1949 that while misguided, Lattimore was no communist. He changed his mind in 1950 to accommodate McCarthy and told him that Lattimore was a red after all. In 1951, McCarthy's comrade in arms, Pat McCarran, launched an investigation of the Institute and summoned Lattimore to testify before the Senate Internal, Sub uh, Senate Internal Sub Security Subcommittee, which he headed. Lattimore spent 12 days testifying. By the end of it, his career was in tatters. On top of professional ruin, he faced criminal charges. McCarran pressured the Attorney General to indict him for perjury. The perjury charges were ludicrous and were dismissed, but it took three years for that to happen. Despite years of trying, the FBI never found anything on Lattimore. As former FBI agent William Su uh, Sullivan put it in this 1979 memoir, we investigated the hell out of Lattimore, but McCarthy's uh, accusations were ridiculous. That didn't stop McCarthy and McCarran from making Lattimore miserable for years. And as historian Ellen Schrecker pointed out, even though none of the charges stuck, they succeeded in making him controversial and therefore in that environment and untouchable. That Lattimore suffered Personally, is bad enough. The extravagant, dis extravagant dishonesty of the charges accomplished a serious ideological goal, making not only individuals, but a certain kind of politics radioactive. And it wasn't just communist capital C or socialist lowercase s politics, but anything that fell short of the hardest lie. McCarthyism could never have happened as it did without a low form of life, the professional witness, typically on the FBI payroll often former communists themselves, they claim special expertise in the movement and its personalities. Among the most notorious were the aforementioned Budens and another named Harvey Matisau. Budens was a tireless vendor of testimony. He traveled all over the place, uh, offering his uh, mostly concocted um, uh, accounts. Budens uh, joined the party in 1935 and quickly rose to be the managing editor of its paper, The Daily Worker. Ten years later, he fell under the spell of the anti-communist Catholic bishop, Fulton Sheen, and with that, the magic of the Blessed Virgin Mary led him away from sin and into redemption. That meant talking to the FBI and Joe McCarthy. By his own estimate, he spent 3,000 hours describing the inner workings of the party to investigators. For such services, he earned about $70,000, the equivalent of 800000 in today's dollars. He had almost no hard evidence, just hearsay. In his early appearances as a witness, in his early appearances as a witness, Democrats mocked Budens, but as McCarthy and company rolled on, they changed their attitude, treating him, in Oshinsky's words, in a fawning manner in 1953. And then there was two-time two -time turncoat Harvey Matisau, formerly the Young Communist League and later of McCarthy's staff. He got there by naming names for pay. He appeared before grand juries, trials, deportation boards, congressional committees. Later, he retracted all his testimony, saying Cohn and McCarthy had blessed his serial perjuries. For the accusation that Cohn had suborned perjury, the feds indicted Matisau, but not Cohn. Of course, there was no investigation of Matisau's earlier repeated testimony. Too many cases depended, up, depended on leaving it unquestioned. Most of the major actors in the second Red Scare came from the right, whether they were frothers like McCarthy or accomplished bureaucrats like Hoover but it couldn't have succeeded without the liberals who accommodated, uh, accommodated them. Victor Navasky's book, Naming Names, is an excellent source on this. 
Victor was a rare liberal of his vintage, born 1932, who was never an anti-communist. In the years he edited The Nation, 1978 to 95, though the main editorial line was unmistakably liberal, he was always open to the left, including me, I'm happy to say. It took a few contortions for liberals to adapt to the violation of civil, civil liberties essential to pursuing the Reds. Their help by the ex marxist philosopher Sidney Hook, who argued that the communist conspirators aimed to undermine the free exchange of ideas the First Amendment was meant, uh, First Amendment was meant to protect. For Hook, our moral obligation is to, quote, the toleration of dissent, no matter how heretical, not to the toleration of conspiracy, no matter what its disguise. The, with this argument in hand, civil liberties uh, concerns could conveniently be set aside. For liberal anti-communists, proving that they weren't reds became essential. This was a stance that predated the McCarthy era. era. The ACLU kicked the communist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn off its board uh, in 1940, and the ACLU wouldn't touch the communist issue for decades. Behind the scenes, the ACLU's performance was even worse. Morris uh, uh, Ernst, a longtime board member, had a private meeting with Martin Deese as early as 1939 to assure him the ACLU wasn't communist and the HUAC should leave it alone. Flynn was purged from the ACLU's board not long after that meeting, and there was long been speculation that there was a, pre, a quid pro quo. Liberal and pop historian um, Arthur Schlesinger, slide 17, thought the CP should be deemed a criminal conspiracy, making membership in itself a crime. He said of civil libertarians, None of these gentlemen is a communist, but none objects very much to communism. They are the typhoid Marys of the left, bearing the germs of infection, even if not suffering obviously from the disease. They just love those disease metaphors. For, for liberals, the problem with McCarthy was mostly his style, not his pursuit of communists. Navasky said it concisely. A. Burley Jr., founder of New York's anti-communist liberal party, in his collection of papers navigating the rapids, uh, rapids makes it clear that the theory of liberalism is a two-front struggle, primarily against the left and secondarily against the right. It is their desire to advertise their anti-communism that helps account for the liberals' otherwise uh, surprising support of positions that even pre uh, President Truman couldn't stomach. Naming names was crucial to the Red Scare. Many of those named are already familiar to the investigators, but the process wasn't just information gathering. As California Congressman ja uh, Donald Jackson put it, the ultimate test of the credibility of a witness is the extent to which he is willing to cooperate with the committee in giving the names who participated with him in the Communist Party. Or as Navasky comments, the, the demand for names was not a quest for evidence. It was a test of character. If you were called, you had a few options. You could take the Fifth Amendment, which was taken as a tacit admission of guilt and would ruin your career and possibly your life. You could plead the First Amendment and go to jail for contempt of Congress, or you could sing. To question the informer system was seen as subversive in itself. This point of view predates, predates McCarthy. Truman's loyalty decrees require the investigation of hundreds of thousands of federal employees, inquiries that heavily relied on anonymous tattletales. Of course, anyone, only those who had something to hide could doubt them. In the weeks after the Wheeling speech, McCarthy repeatedly said that the security risks he was screaming about weren't just communists, but homosexuals as well. He wasn't alone in seeing these two fronts, uh, seeing these as two fronts in the same struggle. The State Department was busily purging as well. They counted 91 expelled on morals charges. Instead of getting the State Department off the hook with the homophobes, though, this did the opposite. It put the agency under even more uh, uh, suspicion. The New Deal had attracted a lot of gays and lesbians to government work, and Washington developed a rich homophile culture, to use the old word. Anti-New Dealers frequently have complained about the influx of long-haired men and short-haired women, one of whom we see on slide 18. With the post-war conservative turn, a moral panic ensued that blended with the war on communists. The State Department was a particular target here as well. The masculinity of diplomats was always in question. Real men go to war or send other men to war. Liberal men constantly had their masculinity questioned. The gossip columnist Walter Winch Winchell, a really evil fellow and a friend and ally of J. Edgar, announced on his radio program on Election Day 1952, a vote for Adlai Stevenson is a vote for Christine Jorgensen. That was the first American to make a gender transition publicly. Atchison's State Department may have begun the purge, but it went to higher gear when Eisenhower took office in 1953. 
Over the next two decades, the, the department fired something, a something like a thousand people, mostly on morals charges, and probably four times that many got purged elsewhere in the federal government. As the 1960s progressed, uh, political activism and a changing judiciary put an end to the sex purges. Well, it wasn't until 1975 that the civil service formally dropped immoral conduct as a firing offense. But the purges were also a great spur to organizing. Inspired by the State Department carnage, former communist Harry Hay founded the first chapter of the Mattachine Society in 1950. Other branches, including one in DC, were founded soon after. They became the roots of a gay and lesbian movement that would flower in the late 1960s. A largely forgotten angle in the joint red and lavender scares is the story of Harvard literary scholar F.O. Matheson, slide 19, there he is with his lover uh, on a beach. Uh, Matheson was both gay and a socialist. He suffered uh, terribly from fear and shame that was the lot of the gay man in his time. He was frequently play plagued by thoughts of suicide because of that, and also a sense that was compounded by, as Randall Fuller put it in an essay on Matheson, sociopolitical failures. Some of those feelings were attenuated, Fuller argues, by the political movements of the 1930s, notably the Popular Front with its unifying and anti-sectarian tendencies. Matheson got involved not only with the Harvard Teachers Union defending leftist professors, whom the university was denying tenure, but also harder core political stuff around labor conditions in New Mexico and tenant support in Boston. For all that, he got investigated by the FBI. Towards the end of his life, Matheson was red baited in an increasingly hostile environment in the late 1940s, but his anxious shame about his gayness also contributed to his distress. Time Magazine hit both notes of the 1948 review of his last book, mocking him as a bald, mild-mannered little bachelor who thinks the job of US intellectuals is to rediscover and rearticulate the needs for socialism. Matheson was no Marxist. He, uh, he was probably a, more of a Christian socialist, but he did American Marxism a great favor not before he jumped out of a hotel window in April 1950, less than two months after McCarthy's wheeling speech, he gave the economist Paul Sweezy a $15,000 of his inheritance, uh, which is the equivalent of nearly $200,000 today, uh, Sweezy's in slide 20. Sweezy used the money to start Monthly Review, one of the founding pu uh, foundational publishing houses of American socialism. Sweezy himself, the son of a banker, had an independent income, you have to wonder where American socialism might be without inheritances. Time to draw some conclusions. First, where did this all come from? I'll probably be accused of sounding too much like Richard, Richard Hofstadter, another bow-tied academic in slide 21, whom I admire dis despite his being seen as uncool on the left. There, uh, as there is, as uh, Hofstadter famously argued, a deep paranoid streak in American political culture and an anti-intellectual streak, a distrust of book learning. That all floresced in the McCarthy years. And I don't dismiss Hofstadter's arguments about status anxiety either. The provincial small businessmen felt crushed between big business and big labor, and they were happy to see McCarthy and the rest making the city slickers tremble. But it was all part of something real too. You might not think highly of the USSR, but it serves as a constant threat to the ruling class, a reminder that capitalism was not the only possible setup. Coming out of World War II, conservatives who never liked the New Deal were looking to step back in time to make America great again. As anyone follows the American right knows, even the slightest incursion on private capital's freedom of maneuver is seen as a first step in expropriation, although DeSantis seems to be getting a, a pass on the, on the Disney issue. That instinct was heightened by the existence of the USSR and a once significant domestic communist movement which, while reduced by the end of the war, was not uh, yet nothing. As Engels said of the reaction to the uprising of 1848, the bourgeoisie showed to what insane cruelties of revenge will be goaded the moment the proletariat dares to take its stand against them. Should our movement get stronger, we could find ourselves the sharp end of that reaction too. It's also important to reflect on the damage McCarthyism, the long period of McCarthyism, not just Joe's heyday, did to us. There was considerable personal destruction, suicide, premature, premature death, unemployment. It decimated the left, not just the communist part, but the broad popular front of the 1930s, the whole cultural apparatus, the skilled union and tenant organizing. As Schrecker, no communist put it, McCarthyism destroyed a vision that was also expressed in a set of ideas, a popular front sensibility that created conceptual linkages between race, class, and international affairs. 
While other groups and individuals wanted to ban the bomb or support liberation struggles in the third world, few of these single interest groups did so within the broader firmer, uh, framework the communist movement encouraged. Seven decades later, we're still feeling this. And while there's no USSR and no CP to speak of, no, no CP of any great size, I should say, there are some real McCarthyite vibes floating around these days. It's easy to see the likes of the senator in today's Republican Party and the era's liberals and the cowardice and complicity of mainstream Democrats, who once again seem more eager to discipline the left, such as it is in their party, rather than to fight the right. That's what happens when you're a party of the capital that occasionally has to pretend otherwise for electoral reasons. But it should also be a reminder to us to be careful about throwing, throwing some of our more militant fellow thinkers under the bus. So many of Hofstadter's status anxieties are the basis of Trump's appeal. Men who feel uh, threatened by the erosion of patriarchy, people who are anxious about the erosion of the gender binary, white people anxious about challenges to their sense of racial superiority, traditional moralists, moralists terrified of weak, wokeness, small business people crushed by globalist behemoths. There's even a personal connection between McCarthy and the current right wing by a Roy Cohn who taught, Roy, uh, who taught Trump a lot of what he knows. You can see the two of them together at the opening of Trump Tower in slide 22. The McCarthy period was one when our side did very badly. Silver linings are very elusive in that era. Thankfully, our next sessions will be about better times for our political ancestors. All right, thanks. Um, thank you so much, uh, Doug and Chip. Uh, wonderful presentations, both. Um, and I think we are interested in going to a Q and A. If um, people want to put any or put their names in the stack, um, we can uh, call on you there. And I wonder if first, if uh, Chip and Doug, if you have any questions for each other. Well, I'd like to ask Chip, um, what, what about the FBI today? Um, you think they're, they got uh, Coadjil Pro going on in DSA? Well, that is a complex question. Um, I, I, so Cointel Pro is term, generally used as a layperson term for like all FBI surveillance, but it was a very specific program within the sort of wider range of FBI uh um actions Quintel pro was actually not a surveillance program it was a covert action program people who were targeted i'm giving a pedantic answer i apologize this is what happens when you spend three years writing a book on the fbi <laughs> um you know but it was a covert act program. i do think the fbi hasn't changed at all or they've changed in some ways but i i, I really do think there is incredible significance to the fact that all of these McCarthyite types and the so-called new right under Reagan start merging together anti-communism with counterterrorism in order to rebrand the FBI and rebrand these types of programs. And, you know, when you look at what the FBI does today, you know, it has a section on in its sort of list of terrorists that includes anarchist violent extremists who are people who dislike capitalism, globalism, and something else. I forget which one. Puerto Rican uh, extremists are still after Puerto Rican groups. Um, the black extremism uh, label that Hoover created is still very much used. And there's a lot of legacies where, you know, one of the things the FBI domestic terrorism unit investigates is civil unrest and violations of federal anti-riot laws. Why is that? That's because the Hoover anti or the Hoover racial intelligence division was predicated on that concept and the category for racial intelligence became civil unrest. And now that category still exists. Uh, this is coincidentally why the January 6th people are being investigated as domestic terrorists and not under something else. You'll always people on the right, like, I can't believe they're investigating rioting as domestic terrorism, but that's been the, 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 um, the bureaucracy for 50 years now. I, I also think there is an incredible degree of surveillance that happens in the run-up between 
1975 period and 9-11, where you see uh, after one of the big World Bank protests, the FBI goes and writes down the license plates numbers of people they think are going to attend World Bank protests. They go to meetings uh, of the Global Justice Roadshow and take photos and try to identify them. So I, I, I do think the FBI is still very much doing what it's always done. I'm very uncomfortable with this sort of liberal rehabilitation of them as an anti-Trump. Because if you think about it, right, what did Trump campaign on his first term? He was gonna spy on Musk. Uh, crime was up because of Black Lives Matter. He was gonna kill the families of alleged terrorists. And he was going to um, bomb the shit out of people. That was his thought. The great anti-interventionist Donald Trump campaigning on bombing the shit out of people. Uh, and, and you look at you know what the FBI is doing in the run up to his election, they're promoting Islamophobia through these deployment of agent provocateurs in the Muslim community where they find very mentally ill people, very desperate people and get them to agree to terror plots that don't exist. And they say, ah, oh, look how much terrorism there is, give us more funding. And, and in the Trump Muslim ban executive order, he actually cites as evidence two FBI agent provocateur plots, right? That's his evidence for the Muslim ban. And Comey is running around touting the Ferguson effect, this idea that because Black Lives Matter protesters don't want to be murdered by the police and they use the First Amendment, crime is skyrocketing. So I, 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 I don't think they've changed. And I, I think in a lot of ways they laid the groundwork for Trump. The fact that they then have this bizarre bureaucratic fight with him and are now the resistance heroes is a um, bizarre turn of history. Well, you could read Trump as being somewhat like a reincarnation of McCarthy, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. Yes. Uh, and liberal objections to him are also very similar to liberal objections to McCarthy. Um, you know, the uh, uh, He's vulgar, embarrassing. Um, and that's why, you know, we need to um, have the responsible bureaucrats of the FBI um, handle these things. And the CIA. Um, a lot so it's, of it, liberal, it's really creepy stuff. Uh, the liberals are playing a very um, sinister role in this. A lot of liberals embraced Hoover and the FBI as an alternative to Hueck and McCarthy. Like, like this is this is a, there's an entire book on, on on this topic. I mean, that was a phenomenon that happened. That if Hoover didn't do it, McCarthy would do it, and at least Hoover respected civil liberties, which turned out not to be true. But it was process, bureaucracy, you know, organization. Um, uh, that's what liberals love that stuff um anyone out there in the um the audience uh, have any questions Let's see we i see a an empty stack so uh looks like jeffy's on stack yeah hey um i was so i really liked the um one of the readings was the lavender scare that passage and towards the end of it it talks about how they like the gay community started like early organizing as part of like the response to the persecution i was wondering if there were any groups of communists or socialists that had similar responses to actually like come together in a similar way and also just if you knew any more details about that just because they're i was just curious more about it since uh the passage didn't mention a ton of details other than i think um specific group forming in Southern California. Yeah, I mean, the the, uh, the Manichean Society, yeah, that uh, started spreading in the 50s. Um, and Hay himself was a former communist who left the party. But I don't think, um, while the gays and lesbians were organizing, um, I don't think the, you know, the socialists and the communists really had anything comparable going on. I may be wrong about this, but it was a really dark time. And, you know, I would, I, uh, politically matured in the, the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, it was really weird and odd to be the leftist. I mean, the the, um, the effects on the socialist left in the US um, continued for decades afterwards. Um, uh, even into, um, the, you know, those anti-World Bank protests that um, uh, um, that Chip Jeffs was talking about, um, it was really weird to be a socialist in that environment. Um, it was much mostly kind of a small capitalist, small as beautiful environment. And um, there are a couple of other like secret communists <laughs> involved in that. 
but I really felt very lonely. Um, I went to a lot of those meetings. I went to a lot of those events. I covered it, wrote about it, participated in it. And um, it, uh, socialism was still in deep disrepute. My um, late friend, um, uh, late friend of mine um, said, I've been a socialist my whole life and I'm afraid to say the word aloud. And that was sometime in the late 1990s. Um, so this, the red baiting really had a really long life. And even the fall of the Soviet Union, um, didn't uh, cure that. It wasn't until uh, Bernie Sanders, I guess, that we started really being, it was okay to be a socialist in public again, or semi-okay. There were attempts to, to organize against what was happening. Um, the earliest one is the National Lawyers Guild, which there's a, a Soviet espionage trial where this woman, Judith Copeland, who probably was a Soviet spy, was giving information to Soviet handlers. And the information she had revealed um, FBI domestic surveillance. So the F so the National Lawyers Guild started a campaign against um, against uh, the FBI to educate the public. Uh, Hoover had informants inside the FBI, so he was able to smear them preemptively. He got Richard Nixon and Huat to attack them preemptively as uh, the bulwarks of Moscow. Uh, they claimed they must be Moscow agents because they accused the FBI of political policing. Working with HUAC, uh, illegal break-ins and wiretaps, all things that are true. Uh, you have the formation of the National Emergency Civil Liberties Committee. Uh, the group I work for originally started as the National uh, Coalition against the House, National Campaign against the House on American Activities Committee. So you, you did see some uh, resistance, although the anti-HUAC resistance really doesn't take off to the 1960s because people are so so afraid but there are some acts of solidarity but but not as many as there should be but they should be celebrated and they should be discussed in, in this context i mentioned there were a few honorable liberals uh and one of them was uh, i have stone um yes. who probably to the left, left of liberals but uh you know he was lucky enough to publish his own newsletter and he didn't have to worry about getting fired um but there are very, very few of them. Um, you know, uh, Navasky's book is really good on this stuff. And uh, also my fr oh, friend, now the nation editor, Don Guttenplan, uh, in his uh, biography of Stone, talks some about uh, the more honorable liberals, but there are very, very few of them. And like the, the socialist movement was just eviscerated. Um, and it took decades to even begin to recover. And, and one last thing I'd say is that like, one of the examples of communist line or communist infiltration was opposing HUAC, right? The church committee talks about how the FBI would attack groups to oppose the FBI or HUAC. Uh, the FBI believed they abolished HUAC, they'd abolish the FBI next as sort of de facto communist groups just for bringing up these topics. So I, as I mentioned, Hoover has this theory, you can't tell someone's a communist, but you can tell if they use the communist line. If you said HUAC was violating civil liberties, that's the communist line. If you said the FBI is political policing, that's the communist line. So it, it opened you up to these sorts of really awful political or policing attacks. Yeah, it's worth uh, getting a copy of, uh, um, oh, um, oh, what's Hoover's book? Um, no, I, I can't remember the name of it. Masters uh, of Deceit. Masters of Deceit, yeah, it's worth getting a copy of that and paging through it and uh, you know, all the signs. Yeah, there are certain ways you can tell who is a communist. You could tell you if your neighbor was a communist if they used uh, certain phrases. Uh, and I believe male chauvinist was among them. Um, so you know, the early feminist movement uh, was guilty by association. Um, thanks. So next up on stack is Lee, then Obi, and then there's also a, a question in the stack after Lee. Uh, Lee? Yeah, um, I was wondering if you would Either one of you would comment on uh, what the effect of the revisionism within the Communist Party itself, you know, the fact that they liquidated a lot of labor work, mass work, they liquidated the, um, the Negro, what they called the Negro Commission at that time. And, um, and then the second thing was about the Hollywood 10 and um, um, the fact that um, in the 50s, uh, they were able to launch a culture which made everything seem okay um, because they had, uh, they had by, by getting the Hollywood 10, they had um, 
silenced many voices. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really don't know about the uh, the revisionism question. I, I think there's nothing the Communist Party could have done to save its ass at that point. They just had the whole force of the American state uh, and uh, its associated media apparatus and the universities and everything, uh, private employers um, stacked against them. It just seemed like I don't think there was anything they could have done. Perhaps the liberals could have been a little bolder and stopped them. Um, Eisenhower could have stopped McCarthy at any time, but he didn't, you know, it, a lot of these people found him useful until he was no longer useful and they, you know, threw him over. But uh, it was just um, such a, 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 a violent and crazy period that uh, I don't see how the communists could have uh, done anything about it. Uh, just speaking of the Hollywood environment, I, you know, the Hollywood 10, I wanted to say something about them, but this, this is such a huge subject and uh, I didn't get a chance to. But a good friend of mine is that uh, Philippa Dunn is the daughter of uh, Philip Dunn, the screenwriter. Um, How Green Was My Valley was, I think, one of his more famous uh, works. Um, he wasn't a communist, um, but he was a liberal uh, and was worried about civil liberties. Uh, and he tried to defend um, his, um, some of his colleagues who were under attack. For this, Philippa, who was uh, in, um, I guess, grade school at the time, uh, was thrown into garbage cans, spat upon um, by her neighbors. She grew up in Malibu, uh, a nice shore house in Malibu. Um, you know, Hollywood does pay well. Um, and um, the, the rumor was they had that shore house because um, they were there to um, warn enemy subs um, or communicate with enemy subs. Uh, she was um, you know, just a, a subject of all kinds of... Um, um, abuse for you know, calling her um, an N-word lover um, because she was a communist. Um, people would just say obscene things to her about that. It was just, you know, here's this kid growing up, the daughter of a liberal screenwriter um, who was not a communist, um, experiencing that kind of torture. And, you know, it's just, um, I don't know how anybody can be, um, <laughs> it's really hard to fight back under those circumstances. So I don't I don't know about revisionism, but one thing I will point on is that the FBI's intensive surveillance of the Communist Party continues well into the 1990s. Um, the FBI likely has over a million pages of documents it compiled between 1976 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. I, I've gotten stuff declassified from my book where the FBI are spying on the movement against the, the first Gulf War, where they're justifying the role of, of the Communist Party in the movement. Uh, it's quite humorous because there's a split in the uh, first anti-Gulf War movement between those who want to criticize Saddam's invasion of Kuwait and those who didn't, and the ones who didn't actually went over and met with Hussein, and, and you'd think they would be the ones who'd be spied on, but the FBI was much more upset about the other group because the Soviets had criticized the invasion and the communists had criticized the invasion. Therefore, if you, this was evidence of Soviet active measures. Um, and, and the degree of surveillance of the Communist Party throughout the 80s and early 90s and the ability of this to vacuum up information about other groups including members of Congress like uh, Charles Hayes and George Crockett, who the FBI claimed were ex-communists, is really an understudied phenomenon because, you know, a, a lot of liberals don't want to look at the Communist Party where they think, okay, they're all Soviet agents, it's justified. And then for people on the left, you know, the Communist Party wasn't in great state, they were revisionists, they were puppets of the Democrats, whatever, whatever the, their, their own party line was, and they were just unwilling to accept that, you know, this type of surveillance was still going on. I, I showed some documents I, I got to a historian of the FBI's war on Maoist, and he's an ex-Maoist, and he was like shocked, be like, I can't believe they'd still be looking at this revisionist F CPUSA in, you know, 1986, and yet, yet they were doing intensive surveillance and gathering information on other people, including members of Congress. Um, I, I wonder uh, if their um, in, uh, interest has been piqued by the fact that um, communist people have been heavily involved in the Amazon unionization efforts in Staten Island. Uh, and uh, some of the organizers used William Z. Foster's manual um, to, as, a, as a strategy device. I bet they're probably um, a little alarmed by this. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I, I just don't think there's as much awareness of it. I mean, there's this sort of narrative that there was all this bad stuff that happened under Hoover, then they reformed themselves, then, you know, uh, not Nixon, 9-11 happened. And, you know, uh, Levi, the attorney general who put the reforms on the FBI, he personally on October the 5th, 1976, signs the authorization for the FBI's a foreign counterintelligence investigation of the Communist Party, which was still active as of 1991. Um, thanks, Chip. So there's this question on the chat. Uh, would you comment on the June 19, 1953 murder of the Rosenbergs and why there weren't more? Uh, it's for Doug or Chip or both. I don't know what the why not more part means. Um, yeah, the Rosenbergs. Um, you know, I guess they're probably guilty of being spies. And I, I you know, I, <laughs> I didn't want to give Eden Kemper to the enemy. Um, but, uh, you know, they had no, um, the Soviet Union would have got the bomb if the Rosenbergs had never existed. Um, but of course, you know, it's just like the fall of China. The um, American uh, a ruling political class could just could not believe that um, this could happen without some sort of uh, sinister cooperation by American traders, because Americans are so much smarter than everyone else um, that, you know, we could have saved China um, if we didn't have all these communists and think tanks, and uh, the Russians would never have gotten the bomb had they not had spies handing them uh, our blueprints. Um, this is nonsense, um, but um, it was just, um, you know, these things fit the narrative that uh, these people wanted to hear. Um, and uh, it was uh, externally damaging. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what the why not more business means, but um, uh, it was just I mean, American paranoia at its worst. I, I mean, Julius may have engaged in espionage, but Ethel probably did not. And the FBI just sort of sacrificed her in order to coerce Julius into uh naming names which he didn't do i mean you have this situation where they basically murder this woman in order to coerce her husband into um you know cooperating this is uh like the the his chamber stuff i know you get i know really lost in this and i like, no, kind of I avoid it no uh, no you're correct to do so that's the why not more part because it's like the his chambers or whatever yeah you know it's like uh, James Angleton said of the whole counterintelligence game, quoting Elliot, um, it's it's a wilderness of mirrors, and it, you know you don't want to get in fight. <laughs> you have to pull pull yourself back to maintain your own sanity. Um, thanks, and we have Obi on stack, then Carl, and then I think we're going to call tonight. Obi, hello, can you hear me? Oh, hello. Hey, great. Uh, hey, thanks. Great, great presentation. Um, I'm gonna. Ask a, hopefully my question doesn't start off with the wrong premise or I have two questions. So the first one is, um, it seems that uh, um, America's foreign policy has a big influence on anti-communism and McCarthyism here. And uh, during the World War II, it seems like we were able to get Americans to hate the Germans and the Japanese, love the Russians and the Chinese. Then right after the war, get us to hate the Chinese and the Russians and love the Germans and the Japanese. So how did we, how did we get the, what did the anti-communists and McCarthyists do during the time when Russia was our ally? And the second question I have is, um, if, if it's true that foreign policy has a big influence on uh, this kind of stuff, what are they doing now? Like, how can we have this kind of stuff now? It seems like, you know, Comey's kind of a lame, you know, they don't really seem like they have much, uh, anything to do these days. So what would they do now? Well, let me answer the second part of your question, because I'm not really sure I have an answer to the first, other than that you know, the propaganda apparatus is very skilled at doing its work. Uh, but, um, you know, I have, as part of my, my long-term project, the decline of the American ruling class, I think they are, are just much less competent uh, than they used to be, um, just much less skilled. and. Uh, you know, you look at they, they couldn't over, they still haven't been able to overthrow Maduro, you know, in 20, 30 years ago, that would have been, you know, an afternoon's work for the CIA, but, you know, they, they can't do it anymore. So, I, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm sure they're very busily investigating things, but um, I just think they don't have the skill or discipline of somebody like Hoover anymore. 
Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll be proved wrong. Maybe uh, we're all, uh, you know, on a, on a list somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think they, it's, it just seems the American empire is over the hill. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't have a good answer to the first part of the question, but I, I would note that the FBI continued its surveillance of communists along with Nazis throughout World War II and arguably uh, put more emphasis on the communists than the Nazis, even during the Second World War. And that's part of what enabled them to uh, begin this sort of McCarthyism at home a full year before Truman even gives the Truman Doctrine speech. Um, as far as what are they doing now? I mean, this is part of the problem, right? We don't know what they're doing now. We find out like four or five years after the fact. I mean, I, I, um, have sued the FBI a number of times to get them to release documents. And, you know, they're always like 10 or 20 years ago, which is, you know, at the time, everyone's like, oh, what are they doing now? They're not doing anything. And, and then we find out about it. But the response is still, you know, that's 10 or, or 20 years ago. Uh, I suspect they are heavily using their domestic terrorism powers to surveil dissent, to preemptively investigate basically thought crimes. I mean, I mean, since 9-11, the FBI's motto or approach has been, we're no longer going to prevent terrorism. Or no, no, we're no longer going to prosecute terrorism after it happens. We're going to prevent terrorism before it occurs. And they have this whole framework around this called, you know, preventing violent extremism, countering violent extremism. And that all sounds really good. But, you know, what is violent extremism? It is uh, ideologically motivated crime. They have these different categories. You have anarchist violent extremist, someone who hates capitalism, and they'll always throw in and is violent. But, but the FBI embraces this idea of radicalization theory, where there's a set, a framework by which one becomes radical, and the first step is adopting radical ideas. So if we're going to prevent terrorism, and we have anarchist violent terrorists, who are people who hate capitalism and act violently, and the first step to becoming an anarchist violent terrorist is to hate capitalism, and you're, you know what you're, you're going to be intervening at the political level at, at purely first and protected speech, which is what the right has always advocated for in this country. Well, they did bust the what is it the um, I can't remember the exact name the African Socialist People's Party Socialist or whatever. Party, yeah, on Farah. Yeah, um, and some of those charges were purely political. They seem like thought crimes. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, yes. And, and I mean, it's a small organization. It's not very popular, and you know, it's pretty. That's a pretty obscure uh, activity. But uh, it was worrisome to, to see this um, prosecution of thought crimes. Um, not everyone knows what you're talking about. What you're talking about? What happened in what was it? So the African People's Socialist Party is a um, pan-Africanist group based in Florida. They were indicted under the Foreign Agents Registration Act for acting as uh, unregistered foreign agents of Russia. The indictment includes the claim they took money from an intelligence operative, which they deny. It also includes things like they put a petition online accusing the U.S. of genocide against Black people. I mean, if you're in the African or they ran for office advocating for reparations for slavery. I mean, these are positions the African People's Socialist Party has had for probably longer than the person who wrote the indictment uh, has been alive for. Um, and it's just sort of attributing them to Russian influence. And it, it does reflect, you know, a lot of the way they viewed uh, uprisings against racism during the first Red Scare, right? It's all the wobblies and the Soviet Union inciting it. Then with King, it's the Communist Party inciting it. Then in the 80s, it's Soviet active measures. You, know, you, you keep hearing these same lines again. And FAR is a very interesting statute because it's generally a statute we apply to lobbyists today, right? I'm going to go lobby for the uh, Icelandic Tourism Bureau, or I'm going to go lobby for Saudi Arabia when they, you know, kill journalists and they need PR. 
But its original intent comes out of a committee on un-American activities, and it's aimed at Nazi and communist propaganda. And at the urging of Martin Dias, uh, the FBI opens three investigations under FAR in the late 30s. It was decided they needed to be into one right-wing group. They picked the German Bund, one left-wing group, the Communist Party, and one group that was American, but who had been so uh, thoroughly infiltrated by foreign ideas. They were now a foreign agent, and for that, they picked the American Congress against war and fascism. I think that was the group. And and the origins of FARA is basically political policing. Um, it was a concern with Nazi and communist quote unquote propaganda. So to see far return to its origins when most of it, most of us thanks to some 1960s amendments think of it as being like registering lobbyists. It's a very interesting uh, moment of coming full circle. It's also fascinating how this uh, Russia has sort of stepped into the role of the Soviet Union as this you know, foreign actor, this sinister foreign actor orchestrating dissent and like racial protests and, you know, criticisms of American imperialism. You know, it's like uh, many people on the American left are very fond of Russia uh, now, or Putin's Russia. But uh, for a lot in the American imaginary, it's just uh, become very much like the old USSR. I mean, you even see uh, people um, slipping. Uh, slips of the tongue where they say Soviet when they mean Russian. Uh, it's it's a it's a, it's it's quite a, a fascinating political bit of a political psychology. You had that bizarre article in the Atlantic magazine on um, Russia's history of intervention in U.S. race wars, and not not civil rights protests, not you know activism, race wars. And the example, the first example they give is. The Scottsboro Boys, apparently people not wanting to execute nine black teenagers for trumped up charges is a race war. And they were literally peddling uh, this idea that the Soviet Union was responsible for getting people whipped up about the Scottsboro Boys and that there was some continuation between this and what Russia was doing now. And my favorite part of this article was they quoted an ex-CIA guy who said, as an example of Soviet propaganda, and the Soviets invented the very idea of nuclear winter. Right, like, like nuclear bombs are gonna die in them is a total propaganda point of the Soviet Union. And the person who wrote this article just, uh, you know, passed this claim off uncritically. She's now a major defender of victims of Havana syndrome who are being ignored by the government. So that gives you her, um, sense of politics but yeah um, thank, thank you for that background and Ger gerard thank you for sharing that link in the um chat uh and then for final question uh, we'll go to carl oh uh can you hear me um yeah. I'll, I'll just be brief the the um i i hope uh you are right doug that the ruling class has become completely incompetent i i actually think though that the I am convinced, although I don't have any evidence, that the FBI is conducting all kinds of surveillance in organizations like DSA. I think that, you know, if you think back to what the Snowden uh, files revealed, that was just a drop of the, you know, a tip of what is actually uh, probably going on in terms of, I mean, they have other means to do it now. They don't need to infiltrate in the same way. They were definitely conducting surveillance throughout the 70s. My father was involved in a communist organization and he requested his FBI file and it was, uh, he requested in the, the 80s and it was several inches thick. And he was not a particularly you know, prominent person. So they, they are definitely very active, I believe, in conducting all kinds of surveillance. And the reason we're not hearing about them is that, you know, a lot of what we call the left today is not engaged in any kinds of activities that would be threatening enough for them to, you know, begin to conduct other that that's that's my my opinion. And I think it's important that we not be naive and think that these institutions do not operate essentially on the same premise they've always operated on. Um, and the other just a quick comment, I think in the in terms of the 1950s, I think a big part of what Lee was mentioning, the, um, the, re the reorientation, the retrenchment, the Communist Party 
in the US, like all communist parties were basically subordinate to uh, Stalin and then later, you know, the, the Soviet Union and all activities were, were seen as secondary and to the survival of the Soviet Union. So there was a, a massive retrenchment worldwide that took place by the communist party. And that's why so many other forces emerged, both in the US and internationally, I think. So. Can okay. I just it... go ahead, Kip? I really appreciate that comment, but I really want to push back on one part of that, which is that they no longer need to do infiltration. Again and again, we learn about instances of FBI infiltration, FBI informants. I believe some of the George Floyd protest, there's been a bunch of revelations from a podcast about an informant. We know that infiltrators and informants have acted as agent provocateurs in the Muslim community. And I do really think that the FBI heavily still relies on that type of infiltration. And a lot of the groups that focus on surveillance in the sort of civil liberties world, which traditionally focused on this, have all moved on to like, it's only NSA bulk surveillance and nothing else still happens. I mean, I had a meeting with a congressional uh, office where I, I gave them this report about all this like FBI bad stuff that had happened in the last 10 years. And like, oh, we didn't know the FBI still did that. And it's like, what? I mean, you have oversight responsibly. What do you mean the, you don't know the FBI still does that? And, and, and I, I think this is something else that, I mean, like, I forget the statistics, but there's a lot of, rightful focus on Hoover's illegal wiretaps, but the church committee found that like wiretaps and electronic surveillance were in like 2% of FBI cases, whereas surveillance, whereas informants were in a, a huge number of them. Uh -huh. There's always been this tendency to sort of push aside the human intelligence for the technological intelligence. And I, 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 would, I would caution people about, I mean, they're both bad, they're both very bad, but I, I think we've become a little bit post Snowden. Uh, get, yeah, not fired from my job as a, yeah. as a civil liberties group. Uh, overly <laughs> focused on yeah. the bulk collection of metadata and not like about the fact that the FBI still has informants in Black Lives Matter, and they will tell you why don't you go put a bomb on a bridge. No, I think that that's true, and everything in my dad's file was uh, almost all of it was infiltration. By, by informants, it was um, very obvious. Let me say two things. One, um, I don't wanna say that they're, they're not uh, spying on us. I think they most certainly are, and not just them, but I think local police departments are doing it. The NYPD's Red Squad or whatever it is now, uh, they certainly did a lot of spying on Muslim groups um, after 9-11. Um, and I'm sure police departments around the country are doing similar things about Black Lives Matter now. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, my my sense though is that you know they may just not be as good at it as they used to be. The whole um, uh, competence of the American ruling class seems to be um, falling apart. But uh, they can certainly do a lot of damage, incompetent or not. Um, you know, I do, do want to express a frustration that now having read a lot of literature on McCarthyism and related topics um, over the last uh, couple of months, um, I wish people would say more often that. The Communist Party, especially the 1930s, was really right about a lot of things and did a lot of great work. And the destruction of the Communist Party it was a very severe blow to American society. Uh, it would have made this, it, had that not happened, it would have been, a, you know, in many ways, a much more civilized country. Uh, and um, I think, you know, it's important to say that and uh, not um, fall prey to our own internalized anti-communism. Um, too often. Um, thanks. That's a good note, I guess, to end on. Um, well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, we just have a couple of announcements to give. Uh, let's see here. Um, one, if you're looking to, uh, if you're not, well, okay, how about this one first? If you're not already a member, but would like to be one, uh, we encourage you to join DSA, become a member. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, finding out what type of activities are going on around town, it looks like the membership committee, it has started this website that has a list of um, events, this, you know, our night school included. Um, and then here we have, uh, 
our, we have three sessions left in our series on socialism in America, um, one on the 60s, one on the 70s, and one on where are we now. You can find them all here. Um, but yeah, the next session will be on the 1960s, the new left and the civil rights era. Hopefully we'll be back in the DSA office um, in two weeks. Um, and let me see if there's anything else. No, I think that's all. Just, you know, big, big thanks to Doug and Chip. Um, Chip was supposed to come up here to uh, present in person and he changed, had a change of plans last minute. But thank you, Chip, for joining us in Washington, D.C. And Doug, um, thank you so much for your presentation, both of you, um, exceptional presentations. And, and maybe we all like, you know, consider lessons, <laughs> the lessons we can learn from McCarthyism. Um, and because there's no doubt they're like kind of around the corner with, um, I don't know how things are looking with the, with the rise of the far right, with the upcoming presidential elections where um, candidates are calling for the open, you know, openly calling for the harassment of the left. And that's like a nice starting point for, you know, development. So anyway, that, that's your note. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for being Thanks part all. of the fight. And uh, um, come join us in two weeks from now for our third to last session. Good night. Thank you. All right. Oh, there it is.